بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another episode of a beautiful word And what a better word than the Holy Quran بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا أما بعد My dear friends Last week we went on to discuss Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, two of the names present in the initial statement of the Holy Qur'an. And as I mentioned, some scholars have said that Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim is a part of Surah Al-Fatiha. Regardless of if you recite it out loud or not, there, that opinion is out there based on the many ahadith where the Prophet wasallam commenced his salah with the recitation of Fatiha and the commencement of Al-Fatiha was Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And uh, we also went on to mention that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is one of the blessed names that the Almighty has chosen for Himself, Allah. And He prefers for us to call Him by His name. Uh, in fact, Muslims, Jews and Christians uh, who are Arab, they have called Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala this name, Allah, for a very long time. I'm just going to mention a grammatical issue with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim for the non-Arabs out there or the Arabs who possibly haven't studied the Arabic language. Yes, many of the Arabs, they speak colloquial Arabic language, colloquial Arabic language or what we call slang. But when it comes to the fusha, they haven't got into the grammar, the syntax, you know, the morphology of the verbs and the other beautiful, difficult issues of the Arabic language. So I'll, I'll just briefly mention when we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful, what does it actually mean? Like in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful, I'm doing what? So that statement will re be related to the action that you're doing. And at times, this action comes with hidden verbs. So in Arabic, sometimes the words of the entire st sentence structure are apparent. And sometimes there are hidden verbs, right? And those verbs come into the meaning, come into meaning by the action that is being performed. So when we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, verbs like abda'u, I commence in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. Verbs like aqra'u, I recite in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful, are hidden. But because of the center sentence structure because of the action that you're doing you can imagine that verb or you can imagine a single word which will bring you know which will give further meaning to the sentence that is already written there and sometimes as i said these verbs are not hidden like for example uh, in the first surah that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed surah al-alaq allah actually writes the word iqra read even if allah said bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq in the name of your Lord who created. It would have made sense by merely the action that would follow, the action that would take place. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually wrote down Iqra here to clarify and emphasize that yes, reading will bring about betterment. Reading, education will bring about betterment to humanity. So even when we recite Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we can imagine verbs like Iqra, read in the name of your Lord, the most kind, the most merciful. Inshallah, before I get to actually uh, interpreting or talking about Surah Al-Fatiha, I want to just give you a small glimpse of wahi, right? Divine revelation that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was blessed with. And when time comes, Inshallah, I'll elaborate further uh, with regards to divine revelation, what it means, how can we make sense of it, so briefly, just to mention right now, there's a narration from Imam Az-Zuhri that he relates from Urwa bin Zubayr radiallahu an, uh, who was known to be one of the fuqaha of Medina, right? Among the six great fuqaha or seven great, al fuqaha was sab'a, the seven great uh, jurists of Medina. He relates from his uh, aunt, his maternal aunt, Aisha radiallahu anha, that initially, 
before actual divine revelation came via angel to the Prophet وسلم, the Prophet وسلم, started seeing true dreams. And according to another narration, very good dreams. And it would be as such that the dreams that he saw, the dreams that he saw would come to life the following day. So for example, if he saw somebody giving some uh, another person charity, and that person smiling and saying a phrase, this would actually happen where the Prophet ﷺ would see that situation occurring, that very situation occurring the, the next day. And after these dreams, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, he became admired by solitude, by being alone and pondering. So what he would do is he would go up to the cave of Hira and those of us who've been to the blessed lands, it's at times a difficult journey to go into the cave of Hira. So you can just imagine the physical strength of the Prophet ﷺ, which we all need to try to, uh, of course we can't get the exact strength of the Prophet ﷺ, but we can try to become healthy, like our Messenger ﷺ was for the benefit of our spirituality and for the benefit of our physical world, right? Our families, our work, the good deeds that we could do, the um, assets that we could be. So the Prophet ﷺ went into the, the uh, cave of Hira and because there was no formal way of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still revealed upon the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ would ponder, right? He would uh, contemplate. And uh, according to some narrations, I would have to check how authentic they are based on the way that Ibrahim ﷺ worshipped that was documented in certain suhuf, certain uh, booklets. The Prophet ﷺ worshipped in that manner. And subhanAllah, uh, um, Khadija radiallahu anha, who was his wife at that time, Khadija radiallahu anha, the first lady, mashallah, the blessed first lady, she would bring food for the Prophet ﷺ. Now you can imagine, once again, the strength of Khadija radiallahu anha, going on a mountain, climbing it, to get to the Prophet ﷺ who's sitting in a cave, right? Worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she would bring provisions for the Prophet ﷺ for a few days. And the Prophet ﷺ would take benefit from these provisions, and he would continue to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he did. Until one day, as we know, the angel showed up. And once the angel showed up, according to some narrations, the, uh, the angel had writing with him or it. And the angel turned to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, read, iqra. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said his famous statement that we, you know, we've been growing up hearing and we've heard in our khutbahs, in seminars, when we went to Qur'anic workshops, we heard the statement, he said, ma ana I don't know how to read. And then according to some narrations, the angel hugged the Prophet ﷺ. Now, when we are befriending a certain individual, the more we befriend that individual, when we have a certain friend, sometimes their characteristics, their characteristics their knowledge, what they know, their attitude rubs off on us. So some scholars have st said, it's not stated you know, in the hadith, but some scholars have said that through this companionship, the Prophet ﷺ gained angelic character. right? And the knowledge which was in the heart of the angel Jibreel transferred into the heart of Rasulullah ﷺ. And this happened back and forth. You know, the angel presented a writing. The Prophet ﷺ could not read. He said, "Ma ana biqara." This happened one last time, and finally, the angel hugged the Prophet ﷺ. You know, grabbed onto him for one final time and recited the first revelation revealed from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala upon the Prophet ﷺ, which is what? "Iqra bismi Rabbika al-ladhi khalaq." خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ إِقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمْ الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمْ عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ So after these verses were recited, 
the Prophet وسلم, became perturbed. He got scared. He saw something out of the ordinary. So he rushed back to Khadija radiallahu anha and he said, Zammiluni, right? Cover me. Cover me with blankets. I'm trembling. I need your companionship. I need you at this moment. Once again, this has nothing to do with the actual hadith, but it's a statement that I'm going to mention uh, as a guidance for us. Now you see the partnership between Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Khadija radiallahu anha. Khadija was made it her maqsad, made it her purpose to look after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she covered him. And she was there for him. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, uh, mentioned at this moment, what is going to happen to me? Now some people have taken this statement, some people who want to criticize Islam have taken this statement negatively, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was speaking about his... Uh, you know, psychology. This was not it, as we see from what followed. Khadija radiallahu anha, she mentioned that nothing's going to happen to you. You've none, done nothing bad. Innaka la tasilu rahim. You know, you join ties when people break ties. You help the mazloom ala zalim. You help the oppressed over the oppressor. You are hospitable towards your guests. And she mentioned many other great qualities of the Prophet sallallahu so what was the Prophet ﷺ worried about? The Prophet ﷺ was worried about his family relations, his relationship with the community, his relationship with society. Will that be affected by him being perturbed? Not his mental state. So subhanAllah, sometimes حَفِظْتَ شَيْئًا وَغَابَتْ عَنْكَ أَشْيَاءُ You look at a certain aspect of an entire narration, but what, what followed, you totally miss it. You, you lose the plot. So Khadija radiallahu anha consoled the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got some comfort out of the statements of Khadija radiallahu anha. So it's very, very uh, mind-boggling to see individuals questioning the psychology of the Prophet sallallahu when Khadija already clarified that there's nothing for you to worry about, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa with regards to these matters. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us an understanding of the Qur'an. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us through the beautiful word. Once again, reflect, um, revive the conduct of the Qur'an and bring the Qur'an into practice, uh, recite it, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you through it. We ask Allah to grant us goodness. Until next time, as I always say, may Allah bless you all, and learn, uh, and, and please share this video, uh, subscribe, and like, and contemplate, and do all that good stuff. Wa akhiru da'wan, and alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Sadaqallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sadaqallahu alayhi wa sallam.